Let someone give you a number. Call me. The College of Physicians know that their money is Okay, so. <laughs> I won't be able to see them. I can't. I will just talk. Mm -hmm. Correct. How was it the second? Hmm? Second of the city. How was it the third? Yeah. 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 Um, revolution yeah. Yeah. Mm, yeah, last week the call was talking about EP and EP. Mm, yeah. Uh, I didn't know they're talking about EP. You know how to program the, the something else, something else. Mm. The second half seems to be very much EP based. Mm. The basics. Basically, not, 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 I'm not putting up EGMs, not putting up anything much into life. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, the, uh, we, we can start now. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to our weekly webinar organized by College of Physicians Malaysia. We are now in cardiology month, and the topic for today is cardiac arrhythmia when to consult cardiologists. We are very delighted to have with us today our chairperson, Dr. Saravanan, who is consultant cardiologist and electrophysiologist. He is also head of cardiology department in Hospital Sotana Pahia. Without further ado, let us welcome Dr. Saravanan. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. And uh, I am Dr. Saravanan here. Uh, we are glad to be invited to participate in this um, uh, month of cardiology education organized by the College of Physicians. Now, I'd like to take this opportunity to uh, thank uh, the, the College of Physicians for giving us an opportunity to present here. And as uh, probably you are aware of, the topic for today is cardiac arrhythmia, when to call cardiology. I sincerely hope that this will be uh, a platform for us to educate ourselves and to improve our knowledge and uh, uh, learn as much as possible to understand uh, about not only the clinical scenarios, but uh, interpreting the ECGs according to the clinical scenario and to refer to the cardiology when it is appropriate. Now, without further ado, let me introduce my speaker here, uh, Dr. Pang. Dr. Pang is currently in his uh, second year of his cardiology fellowship in Hospital Sultanabaya, Losta. He's very much interested in uh, electrophysiology. And uh, when we talk about rhythm, he gets very excited. So uh, I think he's uh, probably the best person for uh, to speak on this topic today. Let me uh, hand it over to Dr. Pang. Thank you, Dr. Sarah, for the kind introduction. Once again, we would like to thank uh, Academy of Physicians for giving us the opportunity to be part of this wonderful program. So I will start with the itinerary right away. So I have no disclosure for this presentation. So um, when facing with, with uh, cardiac arrhythmias, regardless, I think cardiology will be the final managing team. And we are very nice people, actually. Okay, just feel free to refer to us. But the timing on when to refer, and as well as the initial uh, immediate management and stabilization is important. Because uh, unfortunately, in our country, uh, cardiology service is only available in only the main hospitals. So in many, even tertiary hospital and district hospitals, cardiology services are not available, and hence uh, the roles of physicians uh, is very much crucial as either uh, internal medicine 
uh, acute medicine or even emergency physicians. And in some certain places where biomedical officers will play a role. So I, I hope this presentation will help uh, in restructuring as well as immediate management of the patients. So let's go on uh, directly. My outlines will be there's a few, first few cases are more catering for most of the basic ECGs, mass nose, and I will not, uh, I will not <laughs> use too much time on it. And there will be a few case discussion if we have times, and those are the more complicated cases that we have. So let's say the common case that is being referred to us, a uh, 30, 30 years old maternal lady, Carabia 3, Para 2, 38 weeks, refer for pre-op assessments or maternal tachycardia. So, uh, and presented to us, and this is the ECG that is being seen. So what would you do if you have this ECG? So just take a simple poll. All right, I will end the corner for the, for the sake of time. And I'm actually impressed that actually none of the participants uh, actually were interested to refer this case to cardiology, which is why I think, I think we, are, we have succeeded in the first part. So in this ECG actually shows that, that this is a normal sinus rhythm. It's a normal ECG, but why do you think that this is a normal sinus rhythm? So first, uh, it depends uh, on the algorithm or how you interpret it. I prefer to interpret this as uh, being a regular rhythm. And then every uh, peak uh, QRS complex is followed by, a, uh, was preceded by a P wave. And noted that the P wave morphology is in sinus in origin, evidenced by its uh, positive in 2-3 AVF and negative in AVR. This is actually important screening tools for a sinus rhythm. That followed by a narrow QRS complex of less than 100 milliseconds with a normal axis, a normal, an axis, um, in general, we will actually look at one in AVF, looking at both, it should be upright with a negative in AVR. So this is how we screen for a normal axis. And the PR interval is uh, constant in each of these bit. These are the diagrams that's being shown. Uh, it's kind of complicated, but judging from this, as ECG is a summation of vector, an AVR must be negative because it's moving away from AVR and moving down to a 2-3 AVF. All right, moving to the next case. So uh, uh, common uh, uh, referrals, again, referring from maternal tachycardia, but on this, we noted this ECG. So looking at this, what would you have done? Can I have a poll place for this? All right, very good. So um, I'm actually concerned that this, uh, I'm actually glad that there's only a minority that will actually choose not to do anything. Okay, uh, looking at this is looking at this ECG. This is actually a very alarming ECG, especially in a pregnant lady. All right. So what is prominent over uh, this ECG is that there is actually a, a prominence of right heart uh, right axis deviation with marked right ventricular hypertrophy and right ventricular strain pattern. Um, this is highly suggestive of pulmonary hypertension, and I'm pretty sure it was covered by the, uh, my earlier speakers prior uh, in the past weeks. And an urgent echo is required to confirm this. In if your institution is unable to do or uh, perform an urgent echocardiography, please refer to us immediately because this is an emergency. As uh, most patients uh, have this uh, has some congenital shunt disease that was probably asymptomatic until they are pregnant. And if they presented late in severe hypertension, we might lose the patient. This patient needs to be seen early uh, for consideration of termination of pregnancy. All right, this is something that we cannot miss. Um, and another uh, uh, typical referral will be a referring for a decreased upper tolerance with a no, BP of 9676, heart rate of 120, pretty common what we see in the pregnant lady, but then, because of the tachycardia, we did an ECG, and ECG showed this. And what is prominent about this ECG, and what would you have done?
Great. All right, I will end the poll for the sake of, uh, in, in the interest of time. So what is prominent about this ECG is that this is the notorious S1QD decrease as we've seen in pregnancy. And in this situation, a right heart strain is also, is also seen. So in, in this situation, an echo, sorry, in this situation, an echocardiography is important for a prognostication, but it is not, an echocardiogram is not a substitute for a CTPA to diagnose, uh, to diagnose uh, pulmonary embolism. That's why, uh, by, even though if there's ECG changes or right heart strain, if they can't pick it up on right, uh, right ventricle, and in certain situation whereby it's an acute uh, a pulmonary embolism, a uh, right heart strain or a right heart uh, failure use uh, by echography could be operator dependent because some uh, in certain in a gravid uterus, it might obscure the view of a right ventricle. So in this patient, if you picked it up, please arrange for an urgent CTPA. And moving on to the next case, uh, 18 years old gentleman presented with a health screening for a national hockey team. Clinically, he's actually asymptomatic because uh, his interview is coming from a, a competitive spot. We did a routine ECG and what would you do if you see this? Well, the Pesara, half of them choose exercise stress test on the other. <laughs> More than 50%. Yeah. Okay. All right, I'll end the poll now. Okay, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm impressed that actually half of you guys should choose exercise stress test because I got, I got this wrong actually. Uh, all right, so uh, what's obvious over here is that this is a, a move by because of white or accessory pathway, as you can see that the presence of the delta wave that's very prominent over the chest leads. And because she's a national hockey player or a competitive sports player, um, he will require some form of risk stratification for, uh, for the uh, accessory pathway. Not all accessory pathway needs to be ablated, but especially in an active uh, uh, athlete, it needs to be worked up. So in the patient of, if he is asymptomatic, if you, your center could do an exercise stress test, that would be good. And the role of the exercise stress, stress test is not to, to diagnose a heart failure, or uh, sorry, uh, ischemic heart disease. It is meant to actually to diagnose the presence of, uh, the, to re-stratify the accessory pathway, which means that when the patients run, um, typically it will be conducted down through the AV node as well as through the accessory pathway. If, as the patient progresses, progresses heart rate incre increasing pro uh, increased heart rate activity. And we notice that the QRS is widening. It actually shows that the accessory pathway is dominant and is also very active and it, it, it can transmit down impulses easily. So that will require us to re-stratify the patient even further, whether the, uh, whether the accessory pathway needs to be ablated. It, if your center cannot do it, exercise stress test, I think it's better to just refer it to us. But if your center could do an extra stress test and if the patient is asymptomatic, doing an extra stress test prior to referring will be good. And if there are some patients that you see that have seen us or see any cardiology center and risk stratification is done and ablation is not, then probably we have already done the necessary uh, risk stratification and we think that the acidic pathway could be left alone. But if the patient develops further symptoms further, please feel free to refer back to us. And the next patient, uh, that because of that, uh, when the total limb approached me, it was during the heart season. So that, uh, we got a lot of uh, patient claiming for routine screening for heart. So what would you do if someone presents with you with such ECG? Would you refer to, to cardiology or would you work up on your own? Or is the patient safe to go for Haji actually? So uh, this, is, this, is a, this is a simple, and I think you should not miss this. You can, uh, by, by at a glance, you'll notice that this is an irregular, irregular 
uh, irregular rhythm. So by definition, if it's irregularly irregular, uh, 90% or 95% is atrial fibrillation until proven otherwise. And in this patient, it is atrial fibrillation. So the, you can notice the irregular R interval and treatment of AF will not be covered here, but it needs to be treated in a holistic manner by the ABC uh, approach as suggested by the ESC, ESC team. So first will be anticoagulation, symptoms control, and cardiovascular and uh, risk factor management. So when do you refer cardiology for, for uh, atrial fibrillation? Because A, anticoagulation, there's something that you can do, starting NOAC, starting VKA, unless the patient un is unable to tolerate NOAC or uh, VKA, yes, please refer to us because we could do an advanced therapy such as uh, uh, LAA or CUDA. Symptoms control, if it has failed uh, first-line medical treatment, yes, then probably the patient will benefit from uh, AF ablation. And if the patient is high risk, for example, uh, uh, high risk, for example, in heart failure, please refer to us because AF ablation uh, will actually benefit the patient. Uh, based on the current guideline, actually restoring sinus rhythm is a priority and has been associated with a better outcome. But then we do very specify patient on which patient will be uh, choose to ablate due to the time and cost that's involved in our country. Also, um, managing of comorbidity and cardiovascular risk factors can be done from your side, actually. Uh, obesity, uh, education, reduction of alcohol, management of obstetric uh, uh, and now. All right. Okay, this is an interesting case that we had actually uh, last year. Uh, 24 years old, similarly referred for palpitation, but this was the ECG shown in, in the patient. So what would you do, do when you see this ECG? She's young, she's only 24 years old. Okay, so half of you guys actually plan to admit and refer, refer her to us, which is actually pretty good. So in, in this patient, uh, although she's young, pregnant, um, there is this valid like uh, ECG when she's asymptomatic, uh, which is actually quite ominous. Although uh, cardiovascular risk or, or obstructive Vascular effect on in pregnant lady is actually uncommon, but this patient further history actually noted that this patient has a strong pulmonary history of ischemic heart disease. With the brother and sister, both uh, have history of uh, myocardial infarction and require stenting at a very young age. We proceeded with stress tests actually uh, during pregnancy, which turned out to be positive, and we unfortunately proceeded with a CT angiogram as the patient refused a uh, coronary angiogram. So just. Uh, showing a normal angiogram for those that's actually uh, not familiar how a normal angiogram looks like. So on the on the left on the left hand side, I'm not sure whether you can see my pointer. That is the left system. On the right side, that's the right system. All right. And this is the angiogram for this lady. We show a significant three vessel disease at the age of 24 years old. So Looking at this, we actually decided that uh, termination of pregnancy is safer for, for her because if she progresses, uh, as the pregnancy progresses, uh, uh, requiring an increasing cardiac output, that could be more, more dangerous for her. So in certain situations, yes, this patient will require an urgent intervention by us. Yeah. All right, moving on the next patient. Okay, this is a common cases that we actually encounter as well. At 70 years old, especially a retired police officer or fire officer, we handle hypertension, dyslipidemia, referred for us for ECG changes, but clinically he's well. So this is the ECG that is presented, that he came with and um, presented. Uh, I think the poll is for a different question, <laughs> but I'm not sure why someone under <laughs> answered adenosine. So I will close this poll. So look at the ECG and what do you see? So I think most glaring, uh, what should be glaring actually is that there is this uh, ST elevation over the V1 to V3 with a reciprocal 
changes over the V1 to V3 with actually uh, V5 to V6. So some argue that this might be an uh, ischemic event or which is fair, but I think if, we, if you look at it uh, in more detail, you notice that uh, actually the, the Q wave and the sort of R wave from the V5 and V6 is actually very prominent. And this is common what we saw, we see is in left ventricular hypertrophy. All right. So, um, and this patient can tend to come uh, present to a, to a hospital for recurrent uh, in China, probably due to the muscle hypertrophy. And if normally they will have a normal coronary, but the angina will persist due to a mismatch between the myocardial perfusion. So in this patient, um, if they have a coronary assessed once, I think it's safe to say that no, this is not unstable in China. Do not load them with uh, double antipilla every time they come in. They may require a further workup, for example, like septal alcohol ablation. Okay, so uh, be mindful when you pick this, this, pick this up because number one, you could avoid unnecessary uh, anti platelet anticoagulant. And the other thing is you need to work up for uh, left ventricular hypertrophy, look for hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy, to look for any presence of uh, systolic anterior motion or actually high LVOT gradient. So in, if your center does not have an echocardiogram, echocardiogram, please refer it out. But if your center has echocardiography, please make sure to look for all this and do not miss this patient as this patient does carry risk of uh, sudden cardiac death in a, if they fulfill a certain scoring system. And this patient actually requires tertiary care. So uh, if you do see a, a, a hokum, if you do suspect that it's a SAM, please refer to us. All right. Moving on to another still similar pregnant lady trend for maternal tachycardia. This is, a, this is a case that occurred to us last year. Uh, clinically, he's actually fairly sim asymptomatic and he's well, actually. But then this is the ECG that's noted in uh, emergency department. I think this ECG will warrant at least 30 seconds to a minute to, for you to decipher this ECG. So this patient was uh, came in well, but then he was asymptomatic, but then because of tachycardia, everyone was concerned. And when you are encountering with this, I, I would say probably I wasn't sure what I was dealing with at this point. Notice how the complexes changes. And there's in the middle, there's another different complexes before resuming to another uh, to the similar complex as begin. So what would you do when you encounter with this? <laughs> or rather, what rhythm are we dealing with? All right, very good. So I'll close, close them. So for those that's looking at this ECG, I think um, the diagnosis for this, if you if you diagnose this as an SPT, I think that is that is actually partly true. Uh, I mean that's not wrong. Giving adenosine in this situation is not wrong as well. But actually, this is a form of ventricular tachycardia. It's called vascular tachycardia. Uh, ventricular tachycardia, which we actually see that is more frequent right now because I think it's being picked up and because there's an increasing awareness these days. So as you can see, that normal looking beat is actually a captured beat. And notice that there's actually change of axis uh, during at this point, whereby the AVR is pointing upwards, as I pointed out earlier. So AVR must be always uh, downwards because it's upwards. It means that the ventricular depolarization is up, uh, occurring below upwards, all right? So in this patient, um, according to the guideline, actually, uh, the current guidelines uh, actually mention the DC cardio version is actually the first line if the patient is unstable. And if the patient is stable, if the patient is able to tolerate it, uh, although the patient is able to tolerate it, uh, with low anesthetic and sedation risk is low, uh, cardio version is the way to go. Right? Uh, why am I saying this is because I just want to emphasize that cardio version is safe. Uh, Seeing cardiomyopathy is safe, it does not lead to death or it doesn't lead asystole, 
The only thing that uh, about cardio version is that it is painful. So, uh, an adequate if your center could uh, secure adequate sedation, please do not hesitate uh, for cardio version. All right, because cardio version is safe. And this is actually uh, picked up from ESC uh, 2022. And this is what is being recommended right now. Given medical therapy such as verapamil, um, uh, adenosine, if verapamil, if you are considering that it's a vascular VT, that would be the right thing to do. But actually, if it, in the patient on the first presentation, we actually do not know how the patient cardiac function. So if the patient have an undiagnosed uh, reduced ejection fraction or heart failure, uh, verapamil might tip the patient over into an overt heart failure. So, which is why it, it changes the rec uh, current guideline uh, recommendation to this. Okay. So the next case will be, all right. So the device all presented with a functional class three, we noted that heart rate is persistently tachycardic uh, and he present, and we noted that ECG showed this. So what do you think this ECG looks like? Um, do you think this is a sinus rhythm or a sinus tachycardia because the P wave is followed by a QRS complex? Um, and because he is uh, in respiratory distress, hence the heart rate went up. So what would you do at this point? Would you consider an adenosine, verapamil, amiodarone, digoxin, or this cardio version? But at first, what is the ECG diagnosis based on this ECG? So I think this, this is actually quite tricky because it, it was actually diagnosed as a sinus tachycardia by, by my colleague. I mean, by my team, I think it was picked up to my boss. So this is actually a form of atrial tachycardia because you can actually notice there's upright uh, P waves both in AVR and also V1. It's also firing very, uh, very fast with the embedded P wave in between the QRS complex causing this, the broad uh, QRS complex noted in the AVR or the AVR ST elevation. So this patient will require an echo and we need to bring down the rate. Uh, Rhythm conversion in atrial tachycardia is likely not going to be success successful. Uh, it's likely not going to be successful. Uh, and normally, atrial tachycardia is incessant. So what, you, what would you do in your site without electrophysiology center? Yes, uh, you can use do an echo to manage uh, to, op, to ascertain a cardiac function. Manage the rate with either IV digoxin, beta blockers. Uh, amidaron if you really have to, but likely it's not going to convert the rhythm. Bear in mind that it's your target is most of the time is just rate control. Offloading the patient, optimize the heart failure medication, and just refer us for cardiac ablation. This patient will require a, 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 a electrophysiology care because AT is slightly incessant to medication, and it, they progress to heart failure actually quite rapidly. All right. Uh, this is actually to point out uh, or to emphasize regarding if you have understood the first slide regarding which is identified of sinus rhythm, you'll notice that, sorry, that once again, the P wave here is upright in, P, uh, in AVR and is in, uh, inverted in 2-3 AVF. So this is not a sinus tachycardia and this cannot be a sinus rhythm. Uh, some will argue that AVR is upright. Uh, could it be actually a limb lead reversal? Uh, yes, actually, you if you are... If you have that suspicion, please pre uh, repeat the ECG. But in this situation, is the limit reversal is not, but, but it's due to the abnormal depolarization of the heart. So next patient, we have a, uh, how much time do I have now? Okay. Yeah, got okay, so we have another ischemic heart disease patient with a reduced EF, presented with syncope to a private hospital, came to us with low BP, uh, saturating a room air with marked tachycardia. What would you do if you see this ECG? So I, I think without a doubt, if you see this ECG and you refer this to us when the patient is in a hypotensive state, uh, we will not be very pleased. We will not be very pleased because we think you are jeopardizing the patient by by calling us in, in that sense. So I think this in the patient with uh, hypotension with a broad complex tachycardia. Um, ventricular, ventricular tachycardia is the diagnosis until proven otherwise. So I will proceed with a DC cardio version in this situation. And post cardio version, you noted the ECG to be normal. 
Unfortunately, the patient developed recurrent uh, ventricular tachycardia in born. And if the uh, uh, usual practice would be a start, uh, IV amiodarone, even in our center, uh, to maintain a sinus rhythm. But if the patient developed this uh, despite on amiodarone infusion, what would you do? So would you call us? Would you ascertain the electrolytes are normal? Would you stop the amiodarone? Would you uh, consider IV, uh, switching to IV lignocaine? So uh, this is to emphasize that because amiodarone is a very common drug to be used for arrhythmia, we actually, you need to actually be very familiar with the mechanism of action, all right? So this is to, uh, this is to highlight the effect of uh, amiodarone on every changes of electrocardiogram. Uh, I actually took this from the internet. And actually, amiodarone could work by slowing the sinus rate. It could prolong the PR interval and also the AV refractory period. And that's how it terminates the tachycardia. It can also cause a widening of QRS complexes because it slows down the conduction over the ventricular muscle by blocking the inactivated sodium channel. And it can also prolong the QT because of the delete uh, potassium current channel. So bear in mind that these are all the effects of amiodarone. Excuse me. And this is something that you need to look for when you are using amiodarone. Uh, and as, is, as I mentioned earlier, it's a very common drug. So please get me familiarized with this. So if the patient develops a reaction to amiodarone, the, the treatment is, unfortunately, you have to stop the amiodarone. And if you have IV lignocaine, please consider IV lignocaine. If not, please refer the patient out. So let's say if the patient in that round suddenly develops this arrhythmia over, over the cardiac monitor, what would you do at this point? I think I don't have the poll for this, but would you defer blade at 200 joule, sync cardiovert at 200 joule, lignocaine 50 milligram bonus, insert transvenous pacing for override pacing, or would you consider a palliative care as the patient has poor ER and presented with another re recurrent arrhythmia, refractory to medical therapy, or just give us a call? And for those that wonders, uh, actually we see this actually quite frequent uh, in our center. I'm not sure is, is, is it due to our center uh, magnetic field or something, because this is actually an artifact. It has nothing to do, all right? Actually in the midst of that fibrillation that you can see, you can actually see there's a masking QRS complexes that corresponds to the arterial pulsation. So the, the straight signs that you see is actually all, the, all artifacts as uh, ventricles cannot be fibrillating and having a regular or cure a good enough, a strong, good enough depolarization to generate a QRS complex. It just simply cannot happen. All right, so I mentioned again, so if a patient is fibrillating, they cannot have a normal QRS complex or a QRS complex for per se because the, the ventricle does not have time to depolarize and repolarize, which is what we notice we see in the QRS complex. Okay, so uh, moving on. Um, so this is a patient, uh, 78 years old. I'm sorry I've been going a bit too fast, but uh, Dr. Lin, do I have any questions or any burning questions that I have in the question Q&A box? Or should I answer it at the end of my presentation? Uh, so far, there's no question in Q&A box. Okay, all right, that's good then. All right, I'm moving on. This is 78 years old, presented with acute shortness of breath with a history of aortic valve replacement. So on presentation, she's tachycardic and in, uh, in acute heart failure. So this is an ECG that's being seen uh, on presentation. So looking at this, what do you think it is? So as I mentioned earlier, so if, if a patient presented with uh, acute decompensation, uh, ventricular tachycardia will be high on the list. So if you proceed to treat this as ventricular tachycardia, uh, I think it is reasonable, all right? It's reasonable. So what would you do? So having said that, uh, would you sing cardioversion or would you con uh, via electrical cardioversion or would you consider a chemical cardioversion with amiodarone or would you consider, mm, it's okay, let's just control the rate or would you just give us a call? But having said that, if you give us a call when a patient is actually acutely unwell, I think that's it's 
not because if you proceed with a, a ACLS guideline, the rhythm control, I mean, the ECG diagnosis will not really matter if the patient's unstable. So just proceed with cardioversion unless you are familiar with the diagnosis. So what you can see here is actually, there's actually inverted P waves in the V1, lead V1. That's actually very prominent here. The QRS complexes is white, measured about 200 milliseconds. This is the axis is actually way off, all right? The axis is actually, it, it's towards, once again, I mentioned, is towards upwards, right upwards. So uh, making ventricular cardiac a likely diagnosis. The R interval is about uh, 240 milliseconds with a heartbeat of about 225 meters per minute. So in summary, this is a regular inverted P waves, white QRS complex with extreme axis deviation with a rate of 225. So there's, if you, if for those that's more advanced, there's actually something we call as RS interval to look at how is the slurring or upslope of the RS complexes to actually see the speed of the ventricular depolarization. The RS is at 40 milliseconds and there's actually no AV dissociation. So and if you notice, pay attention to this, this is actually a typical right bundle uh, branch with a tall right rabbit ear. So there's an algorithm that we use to actually differentiate SVT and VT, and it's called a Brugada algorithm. Applying this, so we notice that, oh, sorry, if there's absence of RS complexes uh, in the precordialis, it indicates VT, but as I shown earlier, it was present at 40 milliseconds, and the RS interval is less than 100, uh, is less than 100 milliseconds, so it's not in favor of VT. There's no AV dissociation, and the morphology criteria of VT present in both precordially V1 to V2 and V6, it is not present because it's a typical right bundle branch block. So this is more in favor of an SVT. So why is this important in the sense that if you decide to cardiovert this patient, sometimes if the patient have an SVT or an atrial tachy, it will keep, as I mentioned earlier, the, the rate will be incessant. It will keep recurring again. So because there's just a amount of time, how many times you can cardiovert the patient, I guess. And in this patient, if you identify the diagnosis, uh, the treatment will be still a rate control management. Once you slow down the atrial rate, and then the rhythm will resume back to normal. All right. So moving on next, um, this is um, a concept that which I, I would like to impart. So uh, elderly lady presented to us with high BP with bradycardia, a low heart rate. So this is a heart rate that's being uh, documented in ED. So what would you do? So would you consider an atropine? Low dose of atropine, high dose of atropine, would you consider a transvenous pacemaker or transcutaneous pacemaker if your center has it? Observe, or would you refer her to us directly? So this is a common scenario that we encounter as well, uh, especially patients with bradycardia with documented complete heart block. So one patient was admitted to what the rhythm seems to have improved and the heart rate seems to have uh, picked up just without doing anything. So, so looking at the uh, blood pressure and patient is clinically asymptomatic with that bradycardia, we can actually conclude that it's likely a chronic complete heart block with a compensatory hypertension, hypertension. So actually in this patient, just refer to us for a permanent pacemaker, elective permanent pacemaker later, there's no need for any uh, immediate uh, chemical or mechanical treatment for the ECG as the patient is well. But bear in mind in this patient, please do not bring down the blood pressure significantly because the blood pressure is what that is being uh, com is compensating the patient's symptoms. Whereby if you have another patient presented with a low heart rate with this ECG, you can notice that it's similar that this patient is in complete heart block. But the more ominous sign that you should notice is, is that the patient has an ST elevation over the lead 2-3 AVF, and the patient is in a decomposition uh, marked by the, uh, by the sign of showing hypotension. So in this patient, uh, the treatment will be revascularization and immediate um, restoration of hemodynamics. So the concept here is I want to put out is by complete heart block in general, all complete heart block, yes, I agree, they will, develop, they will require some form of treatment. 
uh, in terms of pacemaker or revascularization, depending on the case. But in whereby cases of acute complete heart block, they tend to be unwell, hypotensive, and the etiology is normally due to ischemia or drugs, and the treatment is actually to reverse the ischemia. Whereby in chronic uh, uh, complete heart block, they tend to be well, and they tend to be hypotensive. QRS um, complexes may vary depending on the degenerative changes. And the treatment is actually just don't bring up the BB too much, and the treatment is pacemaker. And why is it, the reason why I brought this up is because there were some patients that actually referred to us, uh, actually referred from Clinic Kasiatan to their district hospitals because of uh, complete heart block in bradycardia. But the patient was well, but the patient was strapped on IV dopamine or IV uh, adrenal adrenaline. And I think some uh, unnecessary transcutaneous pacemaker. If you look at the ACLS guideline, actually they mentioned that if the heart rate is less than 50, so if the patient is does not have a presence of hypertension, a outer mental centers, shock, ischemia, or acute heart failure, the treatment is actually just monitor and observe. Uh, but if the patient does have for that, you can consider atropine. Or if it's ineffective, do consider other treatment or uh, referring to a cardiology team. Just, uh, I'm just sharing this, just bear in mind that in certain cases, medical therapy does not work because it, depend, it depends where the complete heart block or the block uh, originates. If uh, we put it as a, whether it's a suprahesian block or an infrahesian block. Uh, so for those that are interested, I think this, this will be a discussion for another day. Uh, for this, uh, but in general, if it's an intra infrahesian block, medical therapy will not work. So if your atropine dose or your noradrenaline dose does not bring up the BP, it is an indication for transcutaneous or transvenous uh, pacing. Do not push the dose further because it will not work. In fact, it will worsen the situation. All right. So if atropine or noradrenaline does not increase the heart rate, please consider transcutaneous or transvenous spacing. If you do not have the facility, please refer to one that has it. It is an emergency. I think this will be my last case. So if you have incorporated the things that uh, we have discussed so far, so this is a 70 years old gentleman presented with hypertension with acute shortness of breath. So, is the ECGs that uh, uh, captured when he presented to an emergency department in one of our district hospitals. What would you do when you see this? Or rather, what rhythm is this? Okay, so what the hospital did was they thought this is, was a irregular, irregular complexes. It looks like a fast atrial fibrillation. It fits with the patient profile because he's a, he's a COPD patient. COPD patients are prone uh, to atrial fibrillation. So they started him on amiodarone to bring down the rate. But as they start the amiodarone, they notice that the rate goes up instead of, goes, instead of going down. And this is how the complexes begins to change. And you see more of those fast spiky channel that you do not see uh, compared with this. And after a while, the patient actually went to VF and requiring uh, immediate uh, cardioversion. Post cardioversion, they noticed this. So for those that picked it up uh, very, very good, you notice that there's actually a pre-excitation scenes over the V2 to uh, V5, I'm sorry, the V6, uh, V6 as well, if you see the ECG below. So this is actually a form of excited AF, which is something that requires a, or is an indication for ablation because the patient essentially developed a cardiac arrest due to this. So if you pick this up, please refer to us inpatient or immediately because this, uh, if this patient, the risk of sudden cardiac death in this patient is very high. I, so if you have a patient with uh, accessory pathway, bear in mind that the impulse can travel through the AV node and through the accessory pathway. The guide is, Block the, don't block the AV node. Once you block the AV node, everything will go down to the accessory pathway, and the accessory pathway tends not to have any decremental property 
Hence, it can precipitate VT or even ventricular fibrillation. I have two more cases, but I think I'm ran out of time. So I'll be happy to take any questions. So I think someone mentioned how low can we bring down the BP for con con uh, chronic complex heart block? Um, I think in the ideal situation uh, for, for that, but for us, normally we bring the BP to about systolic 160 to 180, and then we arrange for a pacemaker as soon as possible. One question is, uh... I think need revise the to re revise the thing to PR is constant. Looks like second degree two to one AV block. Yes, it, yes, I agree. It is possible. Uh, two to one AV block uh, precipitated by an AV node uh, pathology due to the inferior MI uh, inferior MI uh, leading to AV node uh, ischemia. Yes, Brandon, I actually agree with you with that. Do you know that in uh, patients who supplies the AV node, yeah, the inferior, uh, the right coronary artery usually supplies the AV node. You tend to have sort of like a complete AV or uh, uh, two to one, or uh, you know, second degree AV block, or even a AV node is ischemic. So it can be totally variable, and the treatment should be revascularization and uh, get it reversed. Right. It met for the last case. Uh, we think that it's pre accepted AF met. I, I don't think. So. See, multifocal atrial tachycardia is not a, not a very common diagnosis that we make, and it is usually uh, you know, you have got a background uh, patient where. Uh, history of uh, uh, COPD, whereby the atrias are very typical sites. You can see that there is a in, uh, broad QRS, and also somewhere in between, you get a bit of both. And uh, you see clearly in some of the bits, you can trace it out or track it. Uh, there is definitely a short PR interval, which is uh, not physiological and uh, slurring, and you can spot out the delta wave. So is more in keeping with uh, pre-excited atrial fibrillation. Gosh, can you yeah. scare? Okay, I'm going to. Now I'm going to. Sorry? So if you'd like to take this uh, opportunity to uh, thank It's already shown a couple of cases uh, in of clinical you need to point out or pick up from the graphic representations uh, on that ECG second or 11 second documentation of your cardiac electrical activity. Uh, it gives us a clue if you are right on uh, the arrhythmic event when the ECG is being recorded, then you capture the diagnosis. Otherwise, you will miss it. So, um, uh, just to keep us a reminder that uh, 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 the tracings can be bizarre in order to uh, uh, make a sense out of it, try to rationalize why, what is happening to the different waveforms reflected on the ECG at that point of moment, uh, right? 
So I think uh, with that, we probably will close this uh, 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 education. Else, you will leave it back to us. We will continue stopping this until tomorrow morning. <laughs> All right, Natalie. Is there anything? Uh, thank you, Dr. Saravanan and Dr. Fang for the wonderful talk today. So if there's no more question with that, we will end our session for today. And hope to see you all next week. So, we can leave. Yeah. No one to show this, this one. So if those are still following, so if you see a bizarre ECG and you do not know what to do, just stay calm and cardiovert the patient. If you cardiovert, you might actually see, you might actually unveil the diagnosis. And in this patient, you unveil that this patient actually has an inferior myocardial infarction. All right, with that, thank you. Goodbye.